that is a mouthful, especially for a, a native drum speaker. <laughs> I still struggle with that. Um, yeah, so um, maybe maybe just a few more words about myself and about the company that I work for. Um, so I, I'm not actually based in Berlin. I, uh, I, I'm based in Bochum, which is on the west side of Germany. Um, if you're if you're into in, into German football, the Bundesliga, the, the local club, but just got promoted to Bundesliga, and the office is just next door to the to the stadium. So it's uh, the rest of Stadion Ring 1. Um, yeah. So I, I I used to live in Berlin like 15 years ago. Uh, I, I still like to go there, but I'm not actually a, a Berliner anymore. Um, yeah. So our company we have like 10 engineers. We build open source for for confidential computing and today i want to present you what we are doing in the go space and we we try to to use go as much as we can and we we, we love the language and uh, confidential computing is a super exciting space and we think that go and confidential computing is, is like a like a marriage in heaven it's it's, it's, it's a great combination um, and yeah so agenda for today is First, what is actually confidential computing? Then second, how to build confidential apps in Go. And I'll, I'll, I'll have a demo. And, and the last and, and, and shortest part is uh, how to scale your confidential apps in a, in, 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 in a cloud native sense. And yeah, I, I think the time frame for this is like, like 30 minutes. I'll try to, I, 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 I work hard to stay in the time frame. And if you have any questions, um, please, I don't know, maybe you can post them in the, in the, in the, in the chat or um, I'll stop every now and then and, and, and check if there are any questions or, or ask if there, are, if there are questions. Yeah, I mean, we are not that strict with time limitations now as we only have one talk anyway, right? Okay, I, I still try to be brief because uh, I, there, there, are, there are a few things that I dislike more than the lengthy talks. Uh, <laughs> If I'm in the audience, so I try to stick to the to the fundamentals. Uh, all right. So, what is confidential computing? Um, let's start with the problem. So, as you all know, computers are not trustworthy enough. Right? Don't trust these machines. And the reason for that is um, there are these complicated software hardware stacks, and you want to run your app up here. Um, but for that, you need to trust the operating system, the hypervisor, the hardware. And if that thing is running in the cloud, you also need to trust the cloud providers, employees. You, you need to trust the guys cleaning the data center and, and so forth. Um, so it's essentially a mess. And it's a huge attack service. And attackers, hackers, malware, insiders can, can exploit that, that large attack service. And we, and, and, we, and we hear about all these data breaches all the time. So clearly, we need to do something about it. Um, of course, there are many solutions to data security, um, but um, one that I like in particular is the approach of processing data in secure enclaves. And secure enclaves. Uh, sorry, uh, should the screen change? Because yeah, it, it should. Seems stuck. It's stuck. Uh, let, me, let me check. Um, so I. Let me try again. Share screen. There we are. There's a problem. Yeah. Now, now it seems to work again. And that's it. This is. Yeah. Perfect. Change. Okay. Okay. That's weird. Um, okay. Still changing. Is there a solution on the screen? Okay. Great. Awesome. Okay. So now in comes secure enclaves. Secure enclaves are a hardware enforced environment and they can be created on commodity hardware from different vendors. Uh, Intel pioneered the whole thing. And essentially, um, Intel SGX is, is what Intel is calling its secure enclave. You can go to the CPU and tell it to create a secure enclave for you, right? Just like you can go to the CPU and, and ask it to 
multiply two integers, or you can go to the CPU and ask it to create a VM for you. And the process of creating an enclave is rather similar to creating a VM. And in some regard, you can think of an enclave as, 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 a, as a more secure virtual machine. And the cool thing is, um, enclaves have four great features, four defining security properties. The first one is isolation. So your enclave is strongly isolated from the rest of the system, and the CPU enforces that. It's like just simple access control. The CPU prevents any system component, including the operating system or the hypervisor or other hardware components to, to interact with the enclave in, in most ways. Um, it doesn't allow the operating system to read the enclave memory and other things, but it still allows the operating system to manage the enclave. So the, the operating system can take the enclave and move it around, start it and stop it, but it cannot look inside and it cannot interfere with its execution other than starting and stopping, mostly. Um, next thing is runtime encryption. So um, the CPU encrypts everything that leaves the enclave. So if you if a cache line from the CPU is written to memory, it's being encrypted. If it's, if it's moved back in, it's being decrypted. So you can say that an enclave's code and data are encrypted at runtime in memory at all times. And this protects against very strong attackers, including hardware attackers trying to, to snoop on your memory bus or trying to, to steal your, your DRAM. Um, that's a great feature, and this is what most people are the most excited about. Um, however, there, 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 there are two other super interesting features. Um, one is ceiling. So once you are inside an enclave, you can ask the CPU to give you what is called a ceiling key. And the ceiling key is an encryption key that is only accessible to you inside this enclave. And you can use that key to encrypt data stored on disk. And then if you restart the enclave later on, you can, you, can, you, you can get that key again and unseal your data. It's a bit like, like protecting data with a TPM, um, but it's more flexible. And the fourth feature is remote attestation. And I think this is the most exciting feature actually, um, because remote attestation allows an enclave to prove to re a remote party that it, is, that it is actually an enclave and that it is running a certain piece of code. And how this works is every enclave enabled CPU has a TLS or X509 certificate and private key, sort of. And, they, and the CPU can use that to issue a certificate for the enclave. And the enclave then can take that certificate and convince remote parties that it is a good enclave that is running a certain piece of code. And then you can bootstrap secure channels to the enclave, similar to how you can cr create a secure channel to your, to your online banking website. You can create secure channels that terminate inside this isolated ex execution environment. And that's super exciting because this means you can build these carve out in the cloud that even not the cloud provider can look into and you can, can, can communicate securely with them and you know, you know precisely what code they're running. Um, and there are a couple of implementations. So I already mentioned Intel SGX, which is the most famous one and possibly also the most secure one, uh, but it's a, it's a bit difficult to program. Um, and the rest of this talk is mostly about Intel SGX. Um, if you have a recent Intel laptop CPU, you may have Intel SGX, um, but Intel SGX is mostly about the data center. So Intel Xeons have it and it's available in, in, in different clouds. Um, AMD has something called SEV, only for servers. Apple M1 enclaves um, exist. Um, they're rather proprietary and they only exist on the client side. Um, there's something called ARM Realms. This is the enclave technology from ARM. Um, that's not yet out, but it's coming like next year or so. And they already have the specs out. 
and it's also server side, and then there's also the risk five implementation of Arcanex. So it's quite prevalent, and you can find these CPUs in different locations. Um, yep, so if my explanation was, was a bit too abstract for you, uh, a bit too deep, um, then just think of the Arcanex as a super secure black box you can put code into, data into, and the black box will generate proof that it ran code, that your code on your data and produce certain results. And it can also see some state to this. Um, yeah. Availability is, yeah, quite, quite broad, as I said. Um, Azure has Intel SGX CPUs and AMD SED CPUs. They have a couple of interesting apps. Uh, I used to work on, on some of them. Um, Google has something, and AWS has something proprietary, but quite interesting. It's called Nitro Enclaves. Uh, it's not as secure as Intel SGX or AMD SAV, but it's quite interesting, and it could be a good start. Um, yep, so some app examples. Um, so the technology is rather new, so it's not like there are a ton of apps out there, but some interesting apps are Signal, for example. So Signal uses Intel SGX enclaves in the back end for contact discovery. So your, your Signal app on your phone verifies the, the Signal back end, verifies that there is an, indeed an SGX enclave, uh, that, an, an expected one. And then it sends over your contact details. And the contact details are only processed inside the CQ enclave. And so Signal ensures that your contact details stay private, but you still learn about your contact, who of your contacts has signal installed, right? And if you compare that to WhatsApp, WhatsApp knows all your, con you don't know, knows your entire telephone book, but signal by using confidential computing or enclaves doesn't learn about that. So that's great. Uh, an interesting project, uh, especially for Germans is, is the e -Rezept. And this is maybe the, biggest confidential computing project in the world. Uh, and I, I find it quite interesting. So the e is about digitizing the German national prescription service. So if you, if you go to a doctor, you get a prescription, you get it on paper, right? And you go to the pharmacy and you, and you get your meds. So this is now to be digitized um, or to be online, but because there are so many privacy concerns around um, prescriptions, the, the German government mandated that this has to be built with secure enclaves. And IBM is now building this for a huge amount of money uh, based on S Intel SGX enclaves. And that's quite an exciting project. Um, yep, um, so abstractly, there are two use cases for confidential computing, AKA secure enclaves. First one is make existing apps more secure. And the second one is build new apps. And right, because you have these great properties, you can, you have this super secure, verifiable black box. And if you think about the possibilities, one can create very interesting new types of apps where you can, for example, pool or share data between distrusting parties. Um, quite a few people are looking into enclaves in the, in the blockchain context, like running Bitcoin wallets inside enclaves or running con smart contracts inside enclaves in order to get confidentiality, right? Because if you run a smart contract on the normal blockchain, you typically don't get confidentiality. But if you sort of connect your enclaves to the blockchain, uh, you get a lot of buzzwords but you may also get some, some confidentiality in your smart contracts. Okay, that is, that was the first part, the overview for, or on confidential computing. Are there questions so far? Let me check. Um, no? All right. I take that as a good sign. Um, so let's, let's talk about how to build confidential apps and how to program hardware like Intel SGX. Okay, so um, we as a company, we, we, we don't have a real business model. So we say we are an open source company. 
and we are building different tools to make it easy to use uh, this new paradigm. And the first one is called Ego, and Ego is what this talk, what the remainder of this talk is mostly about. It's uh, a framework, an SDK for programming secure enclaves in Go. Um, the other thing we have is Marble Run. Marble Run is about scaling confidential apps in a cloud native sense. And HSDB is, uh, in essence, a, a SQL database that's running inside secure enclaves. Um, that's all open source. Um, and yeah, let's, let's take a look at Ego. Um, so right hand side, you can see Ego Hello World. So um, it's pretty simple to use. You can install it from the Snap Store. And you can then use three commands to, to build your and run your enclave. And then you have an enclave running. And how, how great is that? Um, and it, if you compare that to, not sure if you ever tried to program an enclave in the past, it used to be super, super cumbersome because uh, oftentimes you only have SDKs for C, C++, or Rust. And sometimes you don't even have full system interface and you, you need to, to work quite hard to, to port existing software. Um, so we try to make this as, as seamless as possible and, 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 and bring all of the goodness of Go to the enclave. And in essence, EO consists out of three components. The first one is a modified Go compiler. So inside Intel SGX enclaves, you cannot issue system calls. You cannot talk to the operating system directly. Um, so we needed a, but, but Go normally likes to, to just to put raw syscalls, syscall instructions into its code. Um, so we need to modify the Go compiler to, to prevent it from doing that. Um, we have some SJX specific tooling and we have some, some libraries that make it easy to derive ceiling keys or make it easy to remote at the station. Um, yeah, and now there's some quick demo time and I'll try to switch over to a different window. There it is. Okay. All right, let me maybe maybe zoom in a bit. So I am connected to an SGX enabled VM in Azure. So there are a couple of, 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 of VM types in Azure that, that, that have SGX enabled. And um, I have Ego installed from the Snap Store. And I have this Hello World lying around. So of course I can do go hello.go. Oops. Go. Sorry for that. Yeah. Hi there. Um, but of course, I want to run this in Enclave now. And as I said, it's super simple. Ego go build hello.go. And this is the modified Go compiler now, essentially. And it created a binary called hello. And I can now go and sign this because every Enclave needs to be signed. And now this enclave is signed. Um, and what does this mean? Let's let's take a look. Um, so I have a, a public key and a private key here. Nothing special for signing. If I hadn't put one here, Ego would have created one. Um, and the other thing that I have here now is I have an enclave.json. And enclave.json is the enclave configuration of my of my of my enclave that, that I'm building here. And there are a couple of, of, of fields here. I can make this a debug enclave or not a debug enclave. Um, debug enclaves are not secure because they can be debugged, but they are of course good for debugging. 
Um, I can set the heap size and some other things, not, not, not too important. Um, and yeah, that's almost about it. I can now type ego run hello and this will now take a bit of time because starting an enclave can take some time, but once an enclave is running, it's super fast. So it's, it's running at native speeds inside the enclave. The only thing that's costly is going inside and outside of the enclave. And in essence, every time you want to do something with your host operating system, right? If you want to interact with your host, you need to go outside of the enclave and you need to tell the operating system to write a file for you. And this can be costly um, because it is a transition. The CPU needs to jump from this mode to that mode. Um, and in the past, you actually need to do this manually, but um, Ego takes care of all of these things and you actually can just implement your Go code and you don't need to, to, to worry about jumping in, in and out of the enclave. Um, the Ego runtime will take care of simulating syscalls and jumping out of the enclave and then talking to the operating system so that you don't have to. And um, of course, this well, this this works for 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 small applications like 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 this Hello World, but it also works for large applications, like very large applications, or almost everything. So you can run HashiCorp Vault, uh, you can run a ton of Go applications, and we we tried many of them, and most of them just just work. Um, yeah, so I. Another thing I wanted to show you is the in in an uh, is the library that Ego comes with, um, and this is maybe where things get interesting. But before I do that, let me show you one more command. Ego help. Um, so there is this unique ID. So I can ask for the unique ID of my of my enclave package. And this is essentially a hash of your enclave package. This uniquely identifies this enclave, right? Um, and the two, pro the, 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 the two security features I mentioned earlier, the, the ceiling key and the remote station, this is all bound to the unique identity of your enclave. So if you if you ask a CPU for a ceiling key, the ceiling key will be tied to your enclave's identity. So no other so that no other enclave can can ever get that ceiling key. Um, if you if you start remote as a station, if you ask for a certificate from your CPU, the certificate will contain this unique ID, and this unique ID is essentially a hash of your entire enclave package. And to make this more concrete, let me show you, um, let me open a new browser window. Let me show you some insights from the library. That we have. Okay, ego.dev. That's the project page. And that's the documentation. And here's the Go library. Yep, so the Go library has a couple of, couple of uh, packages. Um, the Enclave package is all about making it easy for, for, for using confidential computing features inside the Enclave. And a couple of functions here, and not too many. And an interesting function is, see, so just like eight functions. Um, get unique seal key, gets the unique sealing key for your for your enclave. Um, get seal key is similar, but a bit different. Um, and create a station certificate, essentially gets this remote station certificate from, from your CPU. Um, yeah, and all you need to do is call this function and you get an X509 certificate that you can use in TLS connections. Um, and I can give you a very quick example 
One second. Switching the screen again. Okay. Now, I hope this works despite the, the squiggly lines. So I just want to call the, the get unique seal key function from, from the enclave library and then print out my, my, my key. Of course, I sh I sh one shouldn't do this in practice, but um, let's be brave. Okay, uh, ego build, hello. What, no, to edit, uh, okay. Sorry, I should have tried that beforehand. Yep. Okay, now we got a different unique ID. Um, or I'm, 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 I hope we got one. Yep, because obviously we have different code now, right? And the unique ID is unique for your code. It, 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 clearly, it clearly identifies the code that you're running here. Um, and I can now do ego run hello, and it will, pr it will print out my, my unique ceiling key. Yeah. Um, yeah, and normally instead of printing it out, I would of course use this key now to encrypt data, write it to disk, and no one else could derive the ceiling key. Only this this particular enclave can derive the ceiling key, and that's that, that's a pretty 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 awesome property, right? And it allows to 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 create very interesting applications. And people use it, I don't know, to to store their Bitcoin wallet private key, but also to do very interesting other things. And um, we use it to we use the key to protect our database, for example, things like that. Um, yep, and. Just let me go back to the browser for one second. Um, yeah, the, the attestation certificate is for the yeah. same thing, essentially. Yeah. And I can, in the GitHub repository, we have some, oops, someone is on the phone there. Yep. Uh, we have some examples. Um, and I think an interesting one is a tested TLS. So this is a, like a hello world HTTP server written in Go. It's using TLS, it has a TLS config. Uh, this is pretty much what you would yeah, implement for, for having a HTTPS server in Go. And what we do up here is we use the create attestation server TLS config function to create a TLS config um, that uses the remote attestation capabilities of the, of the, of, of the CPU. Um, and if you use that, your enclave will use a certificate that has a chain from the CPU up to Intel that allows you to verify precisely the unique ID. So the client can go and they can verify, okay, is this the expected unique ID? Am I talking to precisely the right piece of software here? And then continue. And as you probably would expect, we also have some clients. Well, we, we have a client side library that does a corresponding thing and checks for, for these certificates and very verifies them. There is a question, I believe. Let me read that out. So does it mean every time I change the program, there's a different key? If I use that key to encrypt data on my hard disk, how can I move that data forward when I did a bug fix in my program? And if I switch machines, are these keys also the same or is the key CPU specific? Very, very good question. Um, <laughs> two, two answers. Um, there is a another thing called there's another thing called 
signer ID. And signer ID is the fingerprint of the public key that used, or the, the private key that used to sign the enclave package. So if you are lazy and you want to, or, 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 or if, you, <laughs> if you are a good person and want to maintain upgradability, or you, you can, instead of relying on the hash of your enclave, you can rely on the fingerprint of your signing key. And you can get a, a ceiling key for the combination of the fingerprint of your signing key and product ID and security version. So these are the two options. You can get a ceiling key for the hash of your enclave, or you can get a ceiling key for the fingerprint of your signing key plus product ID plus security version. And for example, in the case of our company, we have one specific fingerprint. Uh, the product ID of our database is, is 16. So 16 identifies our database. And every time we issue a security patch, we bump the security version number. Um, so this is for the less hardcore, but the more practical amongst you. Um, and you can also do remote attestation based on this, on the sign already. And the, the other question was, if you move to a new CPU, yes, if you move your software to a new CPU, you need to re-encrypt. And this, is, this, this, is, this can be a problem, um, but there, there, there are solutions. Uh, I don't want to go into detail now, but for example, in the Microsoft Cloud, there is a service that can help you with migrate right with, with migration from one VM to another to another. Um, right. So the in essence, Microsoft runs an enclave-based service that can be a custodian for you for your keys. So if you if you're running on this VM and want to move to that VM, you can talk to this enclave-based service at Microsoft and give them your keys and then move over here and then get the keys back. Um, yeah. And you can verify this, this service here using remote station. And if bef before they give you your keys back, they will also verify you using remote station. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. One additional question to that. I think the problem often isn't that I want to move to another VM. Right. But simply a <laughs> VM uh, fucks up, dies because yes. of whatever hardware failure or some yes. cloud provider didn't do the right thing somehow. And I am moved. Uh, and now yes. I have to do funny things. Yes, it, exactly. That, that is a common problem. Um, so if your VM dies and you're being reallocated to a new VM, you get different keys. And therefore, you need to use such a service, or you need to. Um, there are different workarounds, but in essence, you need to have a workaround. Um, and someone needs to keep take care of your keys while you're moving from one machine to another. Yeah. Um, so essentially, you always need a third place to store your keys. In case something goes wrong. Exactly. Okay. What, what we sometimes do is um, we provide, a, when we start up an enclave, we provide a public encryption key. And the enclave then encrypts its master secret for this, for this public encryption key. And if anything bad happens, uh, one can still recover that key. Um, and then restart the anti different machine. Yeah. Okay. And um, one practical question for the ego, the modified Go compiler. Um, mm -hmm. Is it the same API like uh, command line interface? Uh, like the Go compiler, or is it? Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's it's essentially just a few modifications, and we try to keep it up to date um, with the latest version. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so we are a bit behind schedule. So we, but maybe maybe if you're interested in this, um, this is how it, what it looks like. Um, there's your Go app. You run in running the thing on a framework called Edgeless RT, which sort of is creating a, a Unix-like environment. And this we run on top of a, of a framework called Open Enclave. Open Enclave is a project originally developed by Microsoft, but is now maintained by the Linux Foundation. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a C++ runtime for, for or a C runtime for SGX Enclaves. And every time your app wants to do something with the host, wants to write a file or do some network IO, um, this is intercepted by, by Edge's RT and this thing will then jump out, talk to the host and into the operating system. They, those guys will take care of that. Um, yep. Fun fact, uh, all Ego enclaves are also normal applications or valid applications. So you, so, so you can debug them. And um, if you want to run them inside an enclave, you can you, you prefix the thing with Ego run and then it will run inside an enclave. Um, yep, and we're now at the hour. Feel free to drop off. Um, I still owe you the third part of the presentation. Um, let me just tell you that um, we had, well, I, I had a talk at Service MeshCon yesterday, and there I detail, well, I, I gave an intro to how to now scale and deploy confidential apps on Kubernetes. Um, I'm sure that we'll post the talk online pretty soon. Um, you can also message me for a link. In essence, um, we use our framework Marble Run to, or we install it next to normal service meshes inside a Kubernetes cluster and Marble Run then takes care of all the Intel SGX or confidential computing specific aspects in the cluster and essentially makes your Kubernetes deployment a confidential deployment. And that means that not only you have single enclaves inside your cluster, but we essentially extend the concept of the enclave to your entire cluster and make sure that all the services talk, well, run inside an enclave and have enclave to enclave secure TLS connections and make sure that your entire cluster can be verified in one go and that you don't need to verify every single enclave in your cluster. Um, yeah, super easy to install. Um, it will move these into the secure space and then you have all the benefits of confidential computing and hopefully you don't need to modify anything or don't need to modify much in your, in your cloud native microservice architecture. Okay, to summarize, um, confidential computing makes apps entered encrypted and verifiable. Ego makes it easy to build confidential apps um, and Marble Run lets you scale them easily on, on Kubernetes. Yeah, and we, there are different cloud native demo apps out there. Um, I don't know, maybe you know of the OSM bookstore demo or the Linkerd emoji voter demo. And those things can just be using Ego and Marble Run, they can be made end-to-end -end confidential and you don't need to change a line of code. But you need to, to write some configs. Yeah, that marks the end of my talk. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, always open for feedback. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask now or, or shoot me a mail. Thanks. Thank you, Felix. Thank you. But, um, I think there might be still some questions. At least I have some in my head, I think. But um, do we want to make the announcement uh, and what 22nd thing now and the chat afterward uh, like open we, mic we, we could do or? that 
Um, you have time, Felix? Is, would that work for you? Yeah, works. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>